The ashes, if you could wait upon us for that offering, that would be fantastic. Someone put this T-shirt on the pulpit just a minute ago. Fantastic. I might be just a jungle kitten. But mess with me and you'll be bitten. (laughs) Is that the lion of the tribe of Judah? A tiger tiger burning bright. Whose is this? Oh, that's a present for me? Awesome. (laughs) Can't wait to put it on. Now, when you give offerings, you've got to discern that it's from the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Someone just said to me that there's a precious lady here this morning who's already indicated, I want to give my life to Christ. Who, Who is that? Where's Wendy? Wendy, who's that? Who's the lady who's come and said, I'd like to give my heart to Christ? Is that one of the visitors here? That was a message from Wendy, so we'll see. Thank you, Jesus. Was that you, darling? That is awesome. That is so precious. That's fantastic. And is this, is this something that's just happened, or is it because you've come and you've heard the word this morning? What, what's, what's happening to you? You felt the need. Absolutely fantastic. How about we pray with you right where you are? And I'm just going to get you to say words, and these words are powerful because it's an invitation for Jesus to come into your heart, to forgive your sin. Sin is all the unbelief and all the stuff that we've done that's not in line with God. He says, if you just confess that and repent, then I'll cleanse you of that unrighteousness. And the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given. You'll actually have the Spirit of God come. And you'll know the difference. So can you say these words after me? Dear Father God, God, I come in the name of Jesus. For I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. And I receive you, Jesus, to be my Saviour, to be my Lord. I repent of my sin, the root of unbelief, and all its bad fruit. And, its bad and I thank you now for forgiveness, and I thank you total, for cleansing, forgiveness total cleansing, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we thank you now. We thank you now. We thank you now. We thank you now. Father, I declare this morning she has a radical encounter with you, Father God. That right now where she stands in the back of this hall, Father, you would just move upon her mightily. And Father, there'd be such a deliverance out of darkness into light as it's confirmed by her own words this morning that she would know the difference. The light is on and she walks in the light of your word from this day forth. Lord, if there be any disease or illness or sickness in the body, it would flee in terror for salvation has come to this house. Father, the traumas of life in his soul would be miraculously healed and the process of deliverance would truly take place today. Let her know this is the most important decision of her life. And we declare this to be so in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Just expect something to happen right now, Dale. Father, I thank you right now. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mmm. Mmm. Hallelujah. There's something happening in a respiratory system. I don't know whether there's been, there's been a problem there. It's being healed. Just take some good deep breaths. Full of light. <coughs> full of life. Lungs and the respiratory system, full of light and full of life in Jesus' name. No more darkness, no more oppression, no fear of uh, disease, but healed in Jesus' name. Yeah? Fantastic. What a great way to start the message this morning. Just, just, just love her and look after her. 
course, there could be someone else this morning who's never given their life to Christ, and you've just seen that. Is anyone else in that same category? I mean, why wait another hour? Anyone who's never given their life to Christ or has walked away from Christ and needs to come back to Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic, why not? And we're going to pray the same kind of prayer. You don't have to stand up. God doesn't have rules. His only rule is, let me love you. So right where you are, darling. Do you mind saying the words, though? Okay, dear Father God, I come in the name of Jesus. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I receive you, Jesus, as my Saviour, my Lord. Forgive me of my sin, the root of unbelief, and all its bad fruit. And in my latter years, I thank you for salvation. I thank you that I am now a citizen of heaven. And I will see you face to face. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now for the gift of the Holy Spirit, Father God. We're never too young, we're never too old. Father, let the anointing pour into her heart right now. Restore the ears that the locusts have eaten, canker worm, palmer worms, Lord. The things that she's faced in life, Lord, now be her ally, Lord God. Stand with her. You're not the adversary, you're the ally, Lord. Help her right now. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Isn't that beautiful? That's yeah, wonderful, fantastic. <laughs> Hallelujah. Could there be a third? Well, there could be. Oh, God, oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. First Kings 18. First Kings 18. And here in this picture of um, God's dealing with Israel and their opponents, the false prophets, God is addressing an issue which he needs to address again today, and that is the issue of indifference. Indifference. Where the word says you've got to have to make up your mind and choose this day who you serve. And I believe it's a word for us as we finish one year and we enter into yet another year. I think time is speeding up. I think there's such an acceleration in the spirit that even though it's still a 24-hour day by our own timing devices, there's, there's a quickening acceleration. How, can, how have we reached December? I can still picture the January service. I remember it was overflowing with people and it's like just yesterday. Here we are, the end of yet another year. And I feel it's a time for God to address all of his people worldwide to say, Examine your position. How do you stand? How, how are you in your spiritual walk? Take a spiritual inventory to see whether everything's okay. Because you know the day in which we live. You know that there's cataclysmic clashes that have begun, but they're going to escalate in the next season. Spiritual forces that have been unleashed, which are manifesting so violently. And yet it's a call for the church to rise up into the greater anointing and power of the glory realm. The church that was justified, the church that's being sanctified, is the church that will be soon glorified. And we're pressing into higher realms in the spirit. This is how God works the, the restoration of all things. The apex of the power of the church, the early church in those first few years, has been restored to the latter-day church, but it'll even be more glorious, more powerful than even that apex of the early church. Why? Because the truth has been restored. It's the former reign and it's the latter reign. It's all that God's done coming together in that final time frame. And if you believe the prophetic words that have been released, then this seems to be that time frame whereby we can, we can press in and take hold of all that God offers. So this morning here in First Kings chapter 18, starts in... in um, 
Actually, chapter 17, just one verse I want to read. Verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. Take note of those four words. Before whom I stand. There shall be no dew nor rain for these years, but according to my word. That's just the beginning of this whole scenario. But then we pick it up again in verse Sorry, chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And God, God who speaks the, the end from the beginning. It's the wonderful thing about God. You know, when God actually starts something in the spirit, he finishes it at the same time. When God speaks the, the end from the beginning, as he establishes it, it's already done. In the time isn't in reference to God. He doesn't have a time frame. He speaks a word and it's done and the end is already there. That's why you and I have a hope to believe everything God says because it's already done. He's not deciding, shall I do it? Shall I fulfill it? Will I confirm my word? It's done. But by faith, our journey uh, needs to go towards that point, which is the word of God, and keep believing until we receive the manifestation of what God has promised. And so Elijah's already declared there'll be no rain. Remember, he's speaking to a society where the gods and the goddesses of rain and, f- and fertility and all the things that were associated with rain and crops and so on. And that was ruling not only the agricultural uh, life, it was ruling the whole life because food is, and sustenance is so basic to life. And so they would pray to their gods to, for rain, rain, rain. And, God, and Elijah had the word, no rain. No, no, not till the word comes that it's the right time. When the whole word is fulfilled, then there'll be rain. So chapter 17, verse 1, no rain. Chapter 18, the rains come to establish that the word of God is true and that the people of God would take heart to the word of the prophet. And I believe that you and I, to some degree, let prophetic words fall to the ground. We let the prophetic book sometimes fall to the ground because circumstances are so contrary to what God has already said and promised. And there is a line where people become a little bit indifferent. Oh, well, you know, whichever way it works, it'll, we'll just, you know, we'll go with that. No, no, no. God wants a people who would stand before him and would stand upon his word, would declare it and would just believe that it's already done and then keep their faith until they see it happen. So I'm going to read from verses 17. This is First Kings chapter 18, verse 17. Came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubles Israel? What a fantastic question that they say to the church. Are you the ones causing trouble? Well, we are actually. That's not our motive, but there's trouble because we're declaring the truth and it's opposing all the forces that have been unleashed on the earth that are not of God. Are you, that, are you he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and you have followed uh, Balaam. Balaam, sorry. Now therefore send unto me all Israel, to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now, immediately we have three different characters in this story. First of all, we have, a, we have Ahab, we have Elijah, and now we have the big J, Jezebel. And these three spiritual forces are at work still today. And these are the spiritual forces that are in direct conflict in our society today. There's the one who stands before God. Hallelujah. The Elijahs and the Elijah company. We stand before God. We wait for his word. We declare it. We see it come to pass. There's the Ahabs. Who are the Ahabs? They're weak-willed. They're double-minded. They're indecisive. They're inconclusive. They'll just go with every storm. Have you noticed how community attitudes change so rapidly? Have you noticed that the same ones who said, Hosanna, Hosanna, he comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, a week later, crucify, 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 crucify. Now the community attitude can shift so quickly. 
Now that's because it's at the mercy of spiritual forces, particularly the principalities and the powers over regions, as the, they take hold of the sound waves and the words that are released, community attitude can just swing, as we're seeing today, so rapidly. And it's only a small, necessarily small group of people who instigate it, but it soon catches people up in its flow. So the Ahabs are the weak-willed and the weak-minded, and they'll just flow along with anything. And, but without Ahab, there can't be the Jezebel. Jezebel is the controller. Jezebel is the enforcer. Jezebel is very often working with religious spirits, antichrist spirits. They call this the unholy trinity, Jezebel, Antichrist, and the religious demon powers. They work together. But without Ahab, you can't have Jezebel manifesting. Hallelujah. And so you need to have the Elijahs, and you need to have Ahab's strengthening their will, and you need to have Jezebel's being delivered. God says, even a Jezebel, I, I gave room for repentance, I gave time. So you don't kill a Jezebel immediately. You'd be tempted to. But you understand these are forces that have taken hold of the brokenness of human nature. And the enemy comes to take advantage of those usually who have been hurt and wounded and are so broken that they'll accept power from the spiritual realm to enforce their position. They stand before these powerful forces. It's not that they're totally, completely evil in intention, but because of their brokenness, they'll grab any power. It's not a female spirit. It's, a, it's male or female. It's a spirit. It's not a, it's not a female. People often think Jezebel's a woman. Well, it was according to the biblical picture, but it's a spiritual force. Amen? Oh, my. So God's still looking at the church today I believe he sees it. Yes, there's an Elijah company rising up, but yes, there are Ahabs who are just, just allowing anything to happen and accepting anything. Amazing, even false doctrine that people are receiving today. Reading some materials from different streams of the faith and some of the stuff they're teaching and believing. You just have to scratch your head and say, Where, how could they believe this? So contrary to scripture. But because the forces are in the spirit realm, just bending the rules and just bending the whole thing, uh, those who are not standing before God, they'll be easily influenced, especially in this time. You saw a television program of um, a very fast-growing movement um, and often takes place in churches, but it's, it's, I think it's not the unity. That's another kind of false uh, teaching, but it's a group where they'll accept different ministers of different religions who'll stand together and minister to the needs of the people. And to the natural mind, that sounds fantastic. All unity, we all stand together, we're all one, we're all equal. So you'll have the Buddhist monk with the, with the Jewish rabbi, with the Christian pastor, and with the imam of Muslim, of Islam, and they're standing together, preaching, teaching, blessing the people. I'm thinking, what utter confusion. Sad thing was the church was packed. And so these are forces that are really creeping in because the enemy does not want us to remain in God, standing before God, causing trouble to his plans of world domination. Well, he's not going to have the world. This, this earth belongs to our God. Hallelujah. This nation belongs to our God. So let's pick it up again in verse 21. Elijah came unto the people and said, How long... Will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood, and I'll put no fire under it. You call on the name of your gods and I'll call on the name of my God and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it's well spoken. Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for ye are many and call on the name of your gods, but don't put any fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it. They called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. Take note of this. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon, Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud. 
For he is God, either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's on a journey, per adventure he sleeps. He must be awakened. And they cried aloud the more, cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied till the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no uh, answer, nor any that regardeth them. Elijah said unto all the people, Now come and draw near to me. And all the people came near him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and he cut the bullock in pieces and he laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and then on the wood. And he said, do it the second time and they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time and they did it the third time. Can you picture this? And it came and and the water ran around about the altar and filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, let it be known unto you, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done these things at thy word. See, his position was to stand before the word of God. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell, hallelujah, consumed the burned offering and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they brought them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and he slew them. Wow. And then the next verse, Elijah said, Now I have, get up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. What, what I feel the Lord had impressed in my heart today was that we must serve the God who answers. We must get out of the place of indecision and come into full-on faith with the God who answers us. And I know that there's much discouragement in many hearts because answers don't seem to be forthcoming in God. But dare I say it this morning, God always answers prayer. He always answers prayer. Although there may be a delay in the spirit realm, although there may be much warfare to be fought for the answer to come forth, he always says yes and amen if that prayer is in line with his word and his will. Always, always, always. Because if you and I can't trust God in the realm of prayer, we can't trust God for anything. If God doesn't hear and answer our prayer, we are fooling ourselves. And we better go search for another God who answers. And this is the contest that I believe you and I have seen in this city today. We've seen so many new gods manifesting. They're not new. They're the same ancient spirits. But they're manifesting because people don't think there is a God in heaven who hears and answers or cares. And whilst the church is in a place of a little bit of indifference double-mindedness. We spoke on Friday night about double-mindedness. And the root of double-mindedness is the fear of man. And whilst the fear of man is still a snare in any heart, and I believe it is for many of us, even if it's just a measure, a little bit of concern about what they may say, what they may think. And what happens with the fear of man is that we actually draw away from God to the opinions of men so that we can be relevant, so we can fit in, so we can be seeker-friendly. But in that, we may be letting go of the word of God. It may be subtle, but nevertheless, it will have dreadful impacts upon our own lives and our families. If we've taken a position away from God, standing before the word of God, and now coming to the world and standing with the world and trying to agree with the opinions just to keep peace, it's not going to work. You and I can't blend in even if we tried. And believe you me, there are times when we try. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every man was your friend? It's not going to happen. The reason it's not going to happen is it didn't happen to Jesus who knew no sin. Perfect in all his ways. 
And I remember he said early in the ministry to me, he said, if they call me all manner of things, you better believe you're about to get all manner of things called to you. You realise if you're aligned with the word of God, then you're in conflict with the spirits of the age. And there will be cataclysmic clashes. Well, once you understand the principle, you can actually enjoy the battle. Say, well, praise God, I've had some victories and I'm about to have another one. But if we change our position through compromise, then we find that we become a little bit indifferent to the word of God, to the prophetic utterances of God. Oh, yeah, we've heard all this before. But you know, when God speaks, we've never heard it that way before. It's never been in the context of this time and this place. And so double-mindedness is such a curse, we need to just, just get it out of our hearts forever. You know the consequences of double-mindedness? I didn't think I was going to go into this today, but here we go. In the book of James, double-mindedness tells us that it robs us of receiving anything from God. Well, I'd, I'd say that's a serious consequence. Very serious. Count it all joy, verse 2 of James chapter 1, when you fall into different temptations. I don't know how many of us stand before that word. Rejoice when it's really hard. Knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. Patience must have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, how many of us lack wisdom? You know what, I think we all lack wisdom outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus has made unto us wisdom. So the earthly wisdom is sensual and is devilish. It comes from the earth realm and the spirit realm, under the earth, hell. But the wisdom that's from above is different, very different. So if you lack wisdom, you're not sure how to do and what to say, ask God that gives to all men liberally and it never scolds us and it shall be given. Verse 6, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that waves is like the wave of a sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, the further that you and I take and move our stand from God towards others, whether it be the controlling force of others, because those forces have the ability to make us listen to them and obey them, that's what control does. Control is a very insidious thing. It's very, very real. And I believe most people try a bit of control here and there from time to time. After all, I want my way, don't I? So I'm just going to have to... And so we've learned in Christ that when we die to self and selfish ambition, which causes strife and every kind of demon's released where there's strife, that's why churches keep dividing and splitting because of strife. But strife comes from selfish ambition. I want this, I think this, you should do that. I know, I've got better ideas than you've got, all this kind of conflict in the spirit. It's a very serious thing. People sort of say, oh, don't worry about it. What do you mean don't worry about it? Where there's strife, there's every evil work. I mean, where there's confusion, the spirits from hell just invade the place. There's no confusion when it comes to the word of God. It's black and white. It's clear. Hallelujah. So we need to make our stand. I'm choosing to believe what God says. Because one degree off causes a little bit of trouble, two degrees off, and eventually you can be so far off you're in deep, 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 deep trouble. So when we examine our stand this morning, we're going to say, but I want the God who answers. People aren't going to solve my problem. People aren't going to help me in the depths of my need. Even all the Jezebels in the world can't help me. They might come up with smart answers and clever opinions. It's not from God. It's just the strength of the spiritual force that's now taken control of them. And they hate the prophetic because they know the prophetic will bring the people back to God. One, one sure way of knowing the Jezebel force is that it stops the prophetic, shuts down the prophetic. So you have entire churches. No one's allowed to prophesy. No one's allowed to declare the word of the Lord. This messes up our service. No, that's Jezebel saying, I don't want to hear what God says because I've got my own opinion on how to do things. My church and I'll build it. So all leaders are susceptible to Jezebelic forces. Even, even if it's a leader in a family or a small group, it doesn't matter. We're all susceptible because that spirit wants to come to change our position from the word of God because if we're standing before God we're going to get answers from God and it's going to cause trouble in the camp hallelujah for godly trouble and uh, I believe today we're all going to swing back in the fullness of our heart towards God and his word don't entertain the Jezebelic force recognize it if it's within ask for deliverance repent of that thing and let go and let God but if you're under a Jezebelic force or influence, understand it and don't allow it to have control over you. 
It's very manipulative. Often uses great emotion to try and sway you. You know, it'll, it'll sulk, it'll... All sorts of crazy things. It's just a spiritual foul demon. But the people who have drawn near to God, they're decisive, they're conclusive, they're stable, they're consistent. They're, they're because they're believing what God says. They're not perfect, but we're on the road to perfection. Hallelujah. But at least we've made up our mind what we believe and how we live and where we're going and how many are coming with us. Everybody we could influence. We're decisive, conclusive. And that's how it's going to be for us. Nothing can stop us. Hallelujah. So this whole picture from First Kings is so important and I sort of didn't want to bring it really because I thought, oh, you know, I don't know why I didn't want to bring it. Something, some reason. Well, I guess I do know why. Forces at work. Ah, people don't want to hear this. Well, you know what? Sometimes we don't want to hear things, but if it's God, we need to hear things. So the situation of Israel was that now the false prophets were so profuse. Sounds a bit like today. You, you might have one pastor on the corner, but you'll have ten false prophets next to him. There's such a rampant increase of New Age teaching and other world religions, and they're, they're all under the same religious demon power. Even the Christian religion outside of relationship with Jesus has a spiritual entity, a force which is not God. Now that blows your mind. When I first heard it, I thought, I can't believe that. Christianity is Christianity. But the institutionalized form outside of the spirit of God is a religious spirit that's now taken control, as it does over every other world religion. And New Age can be described as a religion, but it's got many, many, many different expressions. So you can understand how subtle this whole thing is. People have fallen for it. Because why? They haven't stood before God. You can stand in church and not stand before God. You can profess to be a Christian and not stand before God because this measures our stand. I stand according to the standard. I stand according to the word, to the best of my ability. I'm conforming my life to this. And if it's, if it's not that, then it'll be a degree off that and there'll be other forces at work. I mean, you might be 90% Christian and, and, and stuff that's not truly truth still trying to Cause how do you know when it's there? Confusion. Two opinions. Or changing opinion. Double-mindedness works that when you're with a group of people at work, you'll sort of conform to what they say, what they do, and you'll fit in. But when you're with the family, a different dynamic takes place, so you adapt to that, and you're saying you do that, which is acceptable to that. Of course, with church culture, well, you just start to conform to what you think are the rules of the place, and you just conform to that. But when you go home slam the door, kick the cat. I mean, it's like well, I've just swung back again. Double-mindedness. Poor cat. I mean, double-mindedness. Double mind. we, we should be so exemplary in all that we do. I know we're not, but we're aiming for it. We want to shine as light in the midst of the darkness. And it all depends on how you stand and whether it's before the God who answers. So Jezebel st stands before Baal, the, the, the demonic powers. Ahab stands before men. I've taken my stand. I'm just going to blend in and fit in and be everybody's friend. Well, you're an Ahab. Well, I'm going to stand before these forces that make sure I get my way and I'll control the situation until I get what I want. Well, you're a Jezebel. But the Elijah say, I'm standing before the word of God to get what God wants. Well, you're Elijah. Part of the Elijah company. And as you read through this whole chapter, as we've just done, there's so many wonderful, wonderful truths that come forth. I love verse 24. You call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of my God. You know, in February, we felt very strongly led to go into um, Northbridge, into Russell Square, and to do what we usually do in the South Perth foreshore, have a 10 crusade outreach. Now, for seven years, we've done it in South Perth, and it's been more intercessory, prophetic, just getting the ground soft and just getting everything right in the spirit, proclaiming, declaring over the city. The Lord said after last year's one, it's finished. You've done a seven-year cycle, it's finished. You've prepared the way, cross the river and go into the promised land. And I know that people have this thing about Northbridge because of the nature of what's manifesting there. But the reason it's manifesting there is that as we've seen in the spirit, the head of the octopus sits over the CBD Northbridge. And it's getting wriggly and it's getting mad because it knows that a sword of the Lord's about to come and go right through its head.
People say, well, I'm not called to North Bridge, and I absolutely understand that reality. However, the tentacles of the octopus went over the suburbs. So to some degree, we're all affected by what decisions are made with the, the mountains of, uh, and the pillars of, of culture that are formed in the CBD Northbridge region. The entertainment, the social life, you've got the, the political life, and you've got educational institutions, you've got a lot of stuff all happening under that foul head of a very powerful demonic force. And it's now kicking, hence the escalation of violence and the rubbish. It's a manifestation of what's there. It's actually not getting worse. It's just coming out to the light. It's been stirred up. Many groups are in Northbridge now. There's ministries all around the edge of Northbridge. If I drew a picture, you'd find it almost encircles Northbridge. From the street chaplains to the Baptists to the Church of Christ to the feeding of the poor to the street people's church and the railway station to the overflow. It's almost like surrounding. God's ready to absolutely take the place. Because if you take the heart of the city, you'll get the city. It's not, it's not because it's convenient. It's not because, wow, I can't wait to go and stand in the midst of hell. It's not that. It's just that if we can do that, and if there's enough of us at least praying for that, we'll make a difference, along with others who are doing the same thing. But what I'm suggesting is this. It's going to be some cataclysmic clashes as the anointing of God starts to really break out. And we felt to do a tent crusade, we, we, we haven't rushed into it unwisely. We've prayed and prayed and prayed. We've hesitated. We've almost felt, oh, we don't want to face this one. But the Lord's made it clear, if it's the centre of my will, it's the safest place on earth. So what we felt to do is to book Russell Square. You may know Russell Square, the rotunda there and the big grassed areas. And to have um, healing tents, destiny tents. We're going to have dream interpretation tents. All the new ages all come running in, you know. And someone said, can we, can we, do, can we do psalm reading? So instead of doing palm readings, we'll be doing psalm readings. <laughs> Just give them the word of God. You know what? People who are, who are indifferent and not sure which way they're going, they'll, they'll receive it. It's only those who are absolutely standing before the demonic. And you know, there's not that many who choose that. Some are taken captive against their will. They don't necessarily choose the word of God because they see the hypocrisy of, of institutionalized religion. So they're in the middle of this sort of oscillation of... Which way are we going to go? Which way are we going to go? And I believe as the word comes forth prophetically and through the land on our hands for healings and miracles, the heavens are open. Uh, there's lots of other groups showing. I haven't had one group say they're not interested. Everybody's interested. There's groups from all over the place, including groups from the country coming up in carload, saying, we're coming, we're part of this thing. We say, well, pray and be sure it's God. You don't just say, let's go and waltz around Northbridge unprotected. You've got to know that you're a warrior. Live music, live dance, um, artists, Christian artists throughout the park. Why are we doing this? We're saying we've got the God who answers. We've got the God who answers. And I believe God will answer. God will demonstrate his power and his glory. He'll bear his arm. He'll convict these people who are on the wrong path. Prophetic words will be more accurate than anything they've ever had before. 1 Corinthians 14 says, when the true prophetic operates, people say, God is in your midst. How do you know all these things? It'll be deeper than God loves you. It'll be God loves you and he's shown me this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And they'll be absolutely amazed. Because some of the stuff you get in the false prophetic, the false anointing is, you know, your grandmother wore red shoes. And they think that's fantastic. Well, probably every woman's got a pair of red shoes, so you're going to be fairly accurate. So people think, wow, how do they know that? But when the Christian comes in with the word of God and cuts right through into the reality of their lives, many are going to say, I want God, the loving, merciful God. But there will be a clash in the spirit realm. We need lots of prayer for this event. And I don't expect everyone to but we would really covet prayers. You will hear more about this, of course. So as we move into a new year, we have to stand before the God who answers Multitudes are still in the valley of decision according to the word of God. Romans 10 says, how are they going to hear? Well, they're going to hear because someone's going to preach to them. We're going to have a lot of evangelists out in the streets and different forms of evangelism. And There's a whole mob from YWAM coming to evangelize and help. And uh, it'll be fantastic. But Romans 10 is very clear about the need for the church to be proclaiming and teaching. And I won't go into the whole chapter, but... 
How can they call upon the name of the Lord, verse 14, of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? Well, you and I are sent ones. We're missionaries to our own city in Jerusalem, Judea, at the end of the earth. We've been sent. Go you into all the world. You'll notice that it's, it's not common to have masses of unsaved people coming to our meetings. It's because God hasn't told them to come. He's told us to go and find them and give them the gospel there and then. So how can people know the truth that sets them free? Well, John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. If you stand before God, the truth will penetrate even the hardest heart. But it's got to be truth. can't be compromised. As I said on Friday, and it saddened me very deeply when one of the, probably one of the best known, or one of the best known um, pastors in America, television personality, don't try and guess him unless, unless you know the story, but it's a person who's got you know, a reasonable amount of charisma and people listen, massive church. But when interviewed with Larry King live about, are you Christians saying that you're the only way? Are you Christians saying that you're the only ones who can get to God and go to heaven? And at that very moment, there was an opportunity before multiplied millions of people to stand before God. And he oscillated and he said, well, well we're not the ones to say that. You know, God knows every heart. And God knows, even if they aren't Christians, their hearts will sink, 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 sink deeper, deeper into sadness. Deeper into sadness. So multitudes will go, there it is. You can believe what you want. Just have good intentions. But I'll tell you what, you and I need more than good intentions. And Northbridge will need more than good intentions. They need a saviour who died for them. And I say this to other New Age people that we sometimes talk and share with, not to confront, but just to try and get truth in. We say there's no salvation without a saviour. There cannot be, by definition, salvation without a saviour. So unless you've got a saviour who died, there is no salvation. There might be an improved standard of living, there might be a different way to think, you might feel a certain peace with what you believe. But if you're talking salvation, which is an eternal destiny, and a quality of your life forever, without a saviour there is no such thing. You know what? Some of them agree. They said, I've never thought of that before. I've never thought about a saviour being the one to bring salvation. I just thought it was the teaching, the doctrine, the philosophy. I said, there's no philosophy on earth that brings salvation outside of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know what? Some people believe it when they hear it. Some people will believe it when they hear it. A young man was there on Friday night at the well, up there in the well, and he... And afterwards, over coffee, I had a chat, and I said, well, you know, you're, you're connected to the church. I'm pretty careful not to usually talk about, what church do you go to? I try not to get into that. But I sort of felt to ask him, are you connected with the body of Christ? He says, no. He said, I got saved at work. I said, how did you get saved at work? I was sitting at my desk at the computer, and the Holy Spirit fell upon me and, and revealed Jesus and said, I'm God. And I'm thinking, you got paid for that? And then, then he made his way to find out where are Christians, where are believers, can I connect? Isn't that fantastic? I mean, I think you can be sitting in a church and even God's not coming down upon us. He says, they don't need me, they've got their little programs. There's this boy at work with a hungry heart and God reveals and tells him, it's Jesus who is God. Oh, I thought, thank you, roll it on Lord, more and more and more. I want to finish by saying this. Elijah did a few things that we need to do. When Elijah finally rebuilt the altar, and that means he restored the things of God to Israel, and he got the 12 stones and he built an altar, he was saying, Israel, the Lord your God is one God and you are his people. And these 12 tribes need to stand together in their destiny. And he built the altar to remind them it's at the altar that sins were forgiven and they were pardoned. He says, you've forsaken that. You've gone to the other gods. You've tried to to reach out to the things that are happening. You've started to worship idols. And I'm telling you, draw near. Watch what I'm doing. Have a look what I'm doing. I'm building the altar. I'm putting all the stones together. We are one and we belong to God. His blood is what we need. That was the lesson. And they all crowded around watching, 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 watching. 
And he said, what's more, I'm pouring water over the sacrifice, I'm pouring water over the wood, I'm pouring water over it, so that if something happens, it has to be the God who answers. It's not the program, it's not the method, it's God himself reaching through an impossible situation. Israel, Israel, look, see, watch. And of course all the world's watching. The world is watching the church. They're watching us. I know they're watching us because they've got such a bad opinion about us. They hate church. But they're watching, otherwise they'd have no opinion about us. And when they see impossible circumstances that are about to hit the world, things that we've never dreamt of but we've been warned about happening, And we're saying, draw near, have a look what our God does. Draw near, come and watch, come and see. And there's a demonstration of the power of God. That'll be in in, in Northbridge in February. We will demonstrate the power of God with healings and miracles, signs and wonders. And let them draw near, let them all watch. I remember some of the work we did, one meeting with the Cancer Council and and the Buddhists were saying, we don't know the, the Reiki healers, we don't have this kind of power. And we didn't do much except we preached. We stood before God, preached the word, and God did the work. And they were, I'm telling you, as God is my witness, they were being slain in the spirit, just even trying to come forward for help. Now, they were well motivated to come forward for help because they all had cancer. So they're probably going to try anything anyway. But as they were coming, bang, 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 bang by the power of the spirit. And it was surprising us. You're not talking about a church service with not Christian people. You're talking about Reiki healers and Buddhists and Hindus and others who've, who had no position before God, but God had placed himself before them and said, I love you and I want to show you. And, and, and the young man had never been to church and he's shaking under the power. He said, I'm not sure what it is. We're going, it's God, it's God, it's God. Why were we afraid to get out there and, and let God be God? This is the example of Elijah. He didn't say keep away. He says, okay, come and have a look. Everybody come close, draw near, draw near, draw near, draw near. God! And the fire came. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. That's our God, the God who answers. Make sure, my friends, you're positioned before the God who answers. And when God answers supernaturally, first thing that happens is this. He demonstrates the failure of our own idols, including Christian idols. He says, I'm going to demonstrate the absolute futility and failure of your religion, dead religion. And it's, it's, a, it's a horrible lesson to learn. But you've got to hit the wall and forsake the idols and say, nothing works. I mean, it's a wonderful frustration to get to that point. Nothing works. Well, I'm glad you've learned the lesson because only God answers. All these other things are band-aids at the best. So he, de- he must demonstrate before the end of the year, I'm saying, God, even idols in my life demonstrate that they're futile. Almost a bit scared of what I've prayed, but it's going to happen. Number two, when God does that, he exposes sin and calls us back to repentance. When you draw near to God, it's a, it's a pure heart, desire to get rid of the rubbish. Thirdly, God causes us to look solely to him. Don't even look to us, don't look to leaders, don't look to... Without walls, just look to God alone. And yes, yes, other things can help and support, but it's God himself. And finally, God calls us to pray. Demonstrates the futility of our idols. Demonstrates that we have to have faith in him alone. And he says, now pray. Stand before me, before my word, and pray. Hallelujah. God who answers. How many know they stand before the God who answers? Absolutely. If you're not sure today, you can make up your mind and say, I stand before the God who answers. Thank you, Jesus. I feel like I said an awful lot then. I hope that wasn't too much. Thank you, Father. Oh, someone who's just got a lot of um, pain in coming down the back of their neck. Can we pray for you? Just let's have the power of God just moving feel it's right to do that today. Who's got a lot of pain coming right down the back of the neck? Can you, can you just come, whoever's there? Some of the healing team could just quickly come. Father, we declare today, Father God, that there be healing in the house, Father God. And Father, we see right down the top of the neck and the shoulders, total release, total release, total release, because you're the God who answers. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This could be timber or... 
Father, we declare, Lord, the God who answers, the God who answers, the God who answers, the God who answers. Heal him and deliver him, Father God, we pray. Just move your neck around till it's totally flexible. God who answers, the God who answers, the God who answers, the God who answers. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A couple of people, I just feel like a burning in the hips where there's a problem with hips. So we just pray for that. The God who answers. Is that a neck, neck problem?